and uh, it's 8.30 on my computer. So I think we will start if that's all right with everybody. Everybody looks ready. We'll get this morning off to a good start. So my name is Jessica Holmes and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Today is day four of our Green Mountain Care Board hospital budget review process. Week two, but day four. So we'll be hearing from Rutland Regional Medical Center this morning and we'll hear from Mount Escutney Hospital and Health Center this afternoon. Um, just as a quick reminder, I've been saying this at the beginning of every day, but for us to arrive at decisions for each hospital's budget, we look to our statute, we look to our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Just as a reminder, we're going to have to balance several often competing factors, the need to slow you know, the growth in healthcare expenditures, while also trying to ensure that our hospitals have the resources that they're going to need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and also to provide the high quality care that we expect in our communities. So as we're attempting to balance cost containment, access quality, and health system sustainability, we're gonna to have to be mindful of this year's unique circumstances and the significant headwinds that we're facing. Historically high inflation rates, workforce shortages, provider burnout, and the continuing impacts of the pandemic. So both nationally and in Vermont, hospitals are facing unprecedented financial challenges as are businesses, families, and individuals. So over the next few weeks, our immediate task is obviously going to be to set these fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for the 14 community hospitals that we regulate. But I want to remind everyone that the board is working closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work outlined in Act 167, which aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that will ensure Vermonters have access to high quality affordable care. And that work is going to involve extensive data analysis and hospital and community engagement, but the end result will hopefully be a more sustainable path forward. Um, as we turn back to the hearing today, I want to extend a thank you to both the Rutland team and the Mount Escutney teams for the time and effort that they've taken to submit the documents for our review. It, it will be a really interesting and informative day. Uh, a few housekeeping notes about the hearings today. This presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed, so there will be a publicly available record. If a hospital's leadership team believes that there is some confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of the hospital's presentation or in response to board or staff questions or HCA questions, please alert us before responding if needed. We can go into an executive session and review confidential information from hospitals. Executive sessions would have to be limited in scope as provided by the open meeting law and limited to just that information such as contracts and information that would be deemed confidential under the Public Records Act. So if an issue of possible confidentiality arises, I will call on the board's legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in executive session and if deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, I would then ask a board member for a motion to go into executive session. So housekeeping out of the way, I think at this point we will proceed with Rutland's presentation. Um, I will hold all board and staff questions until the end of that full presentation. And with that, Russ McCracken, would you mind squaring in Rutland's witnesses? So anyone planning to present or answer questions today, please participate in the swearing in process. Great, thank you, Chair Holmes. Uh, this is Russ McCracken. I'm a staff attorney with the board. Um, for the RRMC team, uh, who is gonna be speaking uh, today? So uh, Russ, we've got myself, Claudio Fort, uh, President and CEO, uh, Judy Fox, our CFO, Dr. Matthew Conway, uh, one of our general surgeons and medical staff president, um, Dr. Allison Davis, who is the medical director of the emergency uh, department of emergency medicine, and Courtney Collins, uh, one of an experienced uh, uh, emergency department nurse and one of the clinical nurse managers for our ED. Terrific, I will go ahead and swear you all in. Uh, if you would raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Great, um, you're all sworn in. Uh, it would be really helpful for us and for the court reporter if um, the first time you speak, if you identify yourself um, by name, it helps with the transcription. 
And with that, I will uh, turn it back over to you, Chair Holmes. Great, thank you. Well, I guess with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the Rutland team. Um, you can, if you have your, your presentation, you can bring it up now. And the Microsoft Teams floor is all yours. Hey, good morning, Madam Chairperson and members of the board, staff, members of the Healthcare Advocacy Office and others. I'm very pleased to be before you this morning again to present uh, the story of Rutland Regional and provide a little bit of the background into the budget we submitted about six weeks ago to you. Um, our story will not be very different from what you heard last week. Unprecedented challenges here in the healthcare space. Um, I've been a hospital CEO for close to 20 years in Illinois, Northern Vermont, and here at Rutland Regional. And I will tell you, I have never seen an environment like we're dealing with today. Um, because we have never seen an environment that we're dealing with today. The modern healthcare system has never been through this, uh, nor has our society. And it all kind of converges here at the hospital. Um, as I said, uh, we have our team here um, joining us to tell our story to this morning. We also have uh, that have logged in on this are members of our board of directors um, and staff from the hospital uh, participating, not participating, but observing these meetings. Um, as you know, Rutland Regional is requesting the second highest commercial rate increase in the state. Um, and as you can see, there's a high correlation with the size of the organization and the scope of services that it offers and the size of our budget requests. Um, just to kind of give you an overview, um, Rutland Regional is the second largest hospital in Vermont, an independent not-for-profit community hospital. We're governed by a 19 member board of directors um, that include the leaders of some of the largest businesses in the state and some of our key uh, health and social service agencies here in Rutland County. We serve about 60,000 people and we are the oldest and one of the more socioeconomically challenged communities in Vermont. Um, our patient volumes and the acuity of our patients has never been at this consistently high level. Uh, our emergency department, as you're gonna hear later on, is ground zero. Um, we are the community stopgap. Uh, we're the place of last resort, not just for medical issues, but we're the relief valve for the epidemic of socioeconomic problems that have emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic. Go to the next slide. Um, over the past two years, our board of directors has revised the mission and the vision and the values of Rutland Regional. Um, to be in line, we have revised our mission to be in line with the state of Vermont's healthcare delivery and payment reform goals. Um, so in the past, our mission was more to the lines of to provide the best care and treatment for you when you come to us sick or injured. This says something very different today. Um, our mission is clearly to improve the health of our community by delivering high value care through collaboration, which means we can no longer sit back and wait for you to become sick or injured in the first place. And that's where the collaboration comes in place. We'll talk to you a little bit about some of the efforts we are doing to collaborate in this health service area with other health and social service leaders so that we can deliver on that mission. Um, and, and this is a pretty, um, you know, our vision and our mission is a, a pretty far reaching, uh, high um, attainable thing. And I will tell you, uh, we are still, and as we've emerged from the crisis part of COVID, um, we're refocusing on our mission, but I will tell you, it is a heroic effort day to day, just to keep the lights on and the emergency department accessible and the beds open. Um, so kind of the scope of services that you see here at Rutland Regional, um, we have, um, 
a 12-bed uh, dedicated intensive care unit staffed by uh, specially trained board certified ICU nurses and critical care clinic uh, physicians and advanced practice providers. We have a 16-bed medical step-down uh, unit, a 23-bed dedicated surgical floor, a 35-bed general medicine floor, a maternal child health labor and delivery uh, unit and nursery. Uh, we have a 19-bed inpatient psychiatric service and we are the only acute care hospital that does, uh, we, in addition to that, we have a six bed level one involuntary uh, inpatient psychiatric service. Rutland Regional started that in partnership with the Department of Mental Health after uh, Hurricane Irene abruptly closed the state psychiatric hospital and we've been operating that ever since. Um, and it has been a good partnership and they're doing incredible work every day up there. Um, here in Rutland, most of our specialty physicians in the health service area are employed by Rutland Regional. No primary care physicians are employed by Rutland Regional. Most of them are organized in a large federally qualified health center. Um, thus, the change to our mission to collaborate with these folks more closely, because the key, if we're ultimately going to change this equation, is how do we work more closely, especially with primary care, to um, try to improve health and delay folks from getting sick enough they have to come to the hospital or to some of the specialists that we employ. Um, we also here at Rutland Regional operate the only comprehensive health hub for med medication assisted treatment services for those suffering from opiate use disorder. We provide uh, suboxone and methadone treatment and wraparound counseling and supportive ser services. Uh, there's about 400 people on any given day that we've given a large part of their lives back. And when I came um, to this uh, community back four and a half years ago, our former police chief, uh, Jim Baker, who was here during that time, uh, told me, he said, Claudio, when Rutland Regional opened the Westridge Center for Substance Use Disorders, um, property crimes in Rutland County went down by about 30%. Incredible impact on that. Um, and I think you're going to hear from us today um, that our senior clinical and administrative leadership here at Rutland Regional, after we submitted the mid-year rate increase, we went back and revisited this level of services that we're providing. And we went back to say, hey, is there anything here that we can cut back on that we that is redundant, that aren't essential services for this community in the service area? And what you're going to hear today is we didn't find anything. Um, and we'll talk to you a little bit about the impact if we are forced to go back and to do some of that. Um, so on the next slide. I think uh, our challenges are clear, and again, they're not unlike other challenges that you've heard last week. Um, we are going to sustain an operating loss of a little over $12 million this year. Combined with our loss on investments, um, our total bottom line will lose about $25 million this year on a $300 million budget of revenues. Um, one of the things that's unique to Rutland Regional that you that that we're experiencing is we we are in default, technical default on our bond covenants at this point in time. Um, and I think I want to make sure that and Judy's going to talk to you about that in a minute. Um, I want to make sure that people listening understand this is technical default. We still are and still have the ability to fully make our debt service payments. Um, but because of our financial situation, there are some things now where we will have to do to work out with our lenders. And like you've heard earlier today, uh, the root cause of this loss is the unprecedented inflation we are experiencing. And again, this is not a Vermont problem. This is a national problem. And as you can see, I'm sure you read about it every day and in your work that you do in academics and in policy, 
uh, you see what's happening. We are at a tipping point, uh, certainly here at Rutland Regional, and I believe in the state of Vermont. Um, it's a fundamentally altered landscape, um, and it is an uncertain future. There are opportunities, and I think we are working, and there are opportunities that we can capitalize and change the trajectory. But at this critical point in time, um, we've come to you with this request because we have no other options. And the impact of not being able to sustain these services and the cost of that, the economic cost as well as the human cost on that, we believe will be much more impactful than the rate increase that we are asking for. So the budget is pretty straightforward. Um, first and foremost, to stabilize our financial performance after about five or six years of underperformance. Um, this budget allows us to continue to prioritize workforce. And everything we're talking about today, everything that we do in healthcare, in the acute care hospital space, it's all about workforce. None of this stuff matters. We will not get costs under control. We will, we will impact our quality, access, satisfaction, you name it. Workforce, it all hinges on workforce and we're doing a lot of work in that space. And then the final thing is, as we said, is to continue to ensure access to critical services for the Rutland Health Service area, and as you will hear this morning, beyond. So this budget that Judy's gonna get into, there are no new service offerings. There are no material increases in staff, except for some security focused uh, work and there are no new programs. So we'll turn it over to Judy Fox to walk you through some of the financial pieces. And just, uh, I meant to say that, um, just so you know, Dr. Conway will have to leave us at about 10 o'clock. He's got uh, some cases scheduled in the OR, so um, uh, he'll have to leave before we'll, we'll be able to get into the questions, folks. So Judy? Sure. So good morning, Judy Fox, uh, the Chief Financial Officer here um, in Rutland. I want to spend a, a, a moment to just talk about our balance sheet. You'll hear us talk about uh, our, the fact that our balance sheet has been destabilized and deteriorated a bit. And I wanted to uh, really draw your attention to why we say that. Um, looking at this slide, this is our balance sheet. Uh, really two moving parts here, um, cash and uh, our uh, debt position. So with our cash, uh, if you look at our performance from 2020 to 2023, you see a decline of cash in $24.2 million. Um, this is the spend down of our cash um, that is related to the operating loss that we are uh, experiencing uh, this, this current year, that $12 million uh, loss is being funded from savings, if you will, on the balance sheet. While we could suffer the cash loss, uh, what has been problematic, as Claudio has alluded to, is that our operating performance uh, will drive us into that uh, breach of our debt covenant, and namely our debt service coverage ratio. Uh, what we have at stake today is about $46 million of um, debt that is held by TD Bank and USDA. So we'll talk about that. Um, but those are the pieces on our balance sheet that we really want to draw your attention to. Uh, they're what has our focus. Um, everything else uh, is fairly stable. <clears throat> so digging down a bit deeper is cash flow. Uh, the budget that we are presenting to you today uh, does drive about $11 million of cash flow. Uh, so cash used to, to fund purposes for the hospital. Um, those purposes we've outlined uh, and we did allude uh, and share with you that we are trying to annuitize our pension plan. There's a contribution cost to that that we've targeted at about $5 million. That helps to de-risk the balance sheet. Um, we have principal payments, and then we do have a delay in spending of, uh, for the MRI, which is really related to timing of the arrival of the equipment. What you don't see here um, is our capital or depreciation. We have level funded 
our capital budget with depreciation this year. Uh, this is the second year in a row that we've done that. Uh, what that means is we are not keeping up with inflationary factors. And you see that aging of our plan in, in 22 and 23. That is a direct result of um, shortening our funding, if you will, reducing our funding and capital. Uh, we did that, uh, if you look at the top graph, in response to just that uh, days of cash and that decline uh, and the need to prioritize cash to take care of the operating loss. In terms of our breach and debt covenants, uh, we came to you in March with the mid-year rate increase uh, asking uh, for uh, a rate increase to help us uh, manage this particular uh, risk for our organization. Um, and what we uh, spoke to you about has come true. Um, we see a, a declining uh, uh, position in this debt covenant related to our operating loss that uh, we have suffered month after month, uh, such that by September 30th, we will be in breach of the debt service coverage. And I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, what that response is. From an income statement perspective, we're going to look at the detail. I won't spend much time on this slide here. But starting at utilization and revenue, um, we'd like to ask you to consider our budget um, from projection 22 and not budget to budget. Um, and we'll look at a slide that uh, gives us some um, a demonstration, if you will, as to why we, we'd ask you to do that. When you look at projection to budget, and this is gross revenue, this is not net revenue, the only difference is our rate increase. Um, with a small reduction uh, in, in revenue that's really related to physician vacancies uh, and timing of service. This budget is predicated on an occupancy rate. You can see um, uh, outlined there on the left. Those occupancy rates are year to date. If I were to run those occupancy rates just for the last two months, our medical surge, med surge occupancy rate would be near 90%. Uh, so volume is not letting up, uh, just, just the opposite. On average, we have 10 patients a day waiting placement, whether that's a nursing home placement or a psychiatric placement for another inpatient psychiatric facility. That's 11% of our volume. From a nursing home uh, uh, placement standpoint, that's a revenue loss. There's no revenue stream for those patients or very little. Um, on average, we will lose between two and a half and $3 million on the care of those patients awaiting placement. Again, our utilization is based on actual volume. Uh, we expect that volume to continue. Uh, the last couple of months, uh, we've seen an increase. Uh, we've not built that into our budget. Um, <clears throat> and then we will continue with our recruitment plan of our physicians. And we'll look at those physician vacancies. From a rate increase perspective, we are asking you to, to approve a 17.8% rate increase. We arrive at that in a couple of different ways. Uh, first and foremost is our pharmaceutical and supply charges. Uh, those charges are based on actual acquisition costs. Due to the approval of the budget, we're not able to change uh, those costs mid-year as we faced inflation. Uh, and so this budget uh, rate increase strategy takes our most uh, recent uh, up-to-date acquisition costs based on a tiering structure. The result is our pharmaceutical prices will go up on average about 11.2% our supplies 11.9. Again, highly driven by inflation, uh, which we'll see in a later slide. All other services are at 19.5%. You've asked about the effective commercial rate. If you look at that uh, schedule on the bottom, you see that this rate increase generates $123 million of gross revenue, but only $24 million of net. Most of that underfunding comes from state and federal programs, the Medicare and Medicaid program, uh, where we are uh, in this budget um, 
expecting to get a 1.6% increase, a $1.6 million increase in funding. Where the bulk of the net revenue comes from is in the commercial carriers, the 22.1 million. If you ask me what the effective rate is, I would tell you it's about 10.8%. The reason it's not 17.8% uh, is related to the contracts that we have in place with our uh, commercial carriers, those discounts that um, are supported within those contracts or the fee schedules. So our effective commercial rate is about 10.8%. I do want to uh, be very transparent and tell you at the time that we put this budget together, we were working under proposed inpatient Medicare rules. As you know, those rules were just updated within the last few weeks. Based on that new update, uh, moving from a 3.2 to a 4.3 market basket update, uh, we would increase our net revenue about $600,000 for the Medicare program. That's equivalent of a, about a half a percent of rate increase. This has been a very difficult decision for our community, our board, and our management team. Uh, we understand uh, the concern of affordability, but we're also concerned about access. Um, and so we have tried to be very considerate with how we approach this rate increase, but also uh, make sure that we're really advocating for the patients through our free care program and trying to provide them support uh, in, in this uh, arena where we're seeing just these the, the high costs. From a reimbursement perspective, um, this is really cost shift, right? And if you look at the top graph compared to the bottom graph, you can see uh, what this rate increase does. Um, if you look at that uh, green portion of the pie graph, you can see that our commercial carriers from a growth standpoint make up just under 30% of our volume. But from a net revenue, they're at 54%. Um, that is the difficulty um, in uh, putting through a rate increase. It's with the rate increases become more and more ineffective each year. Um, the non-participating rate increase is about 31%. Those are the Medicare and Medicaid programs. We also are um, including a full year of sequestration, uh, which is going to be reinstated for the Medicare program. And again, you see that update at 1.6 million. Again, $600,000 not included there uh, with the new rate schedules. On average, uh, because of this cost shift and who participates, every dollar we raise in a rate increase, we collect about 19 cents. This is a really important slide. Um, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of um, uh, variance in our performance when we look from 2020 to 2023. The red line on the graph is what the Green Mountain Care Board would have allowed in their net patient growth rates year over year starting in 2020. The green line is our actual performance. You can see the impact of COVID in 2021, 2022, and then the resurgence of that revenue in 2023, where we're saying we're holding uh, the, the utilization, holding the volume, but because of the inflation, do have to pass on rate increases. The result though, is that we are nearly on target with the Green Mountain Care Board growth rates when you look over those four years. So an important slide. We understand that without the collaboration of our care providers in our community, we are not going to be able uh, to uh, change demand for services here at the hospital. Uh, as a result of that, and Claudio alluded, we've changed our mission um, and we are participating in all ACO programs that are being offered. For us, that's about 26,000 lives or about 30% of our revenue basis. Unfortunately, we're participating without knowing all of the rules. Um, and so as we speak this morning, uh, we have uh, signed all agreements, but we don't yet know what those risk corridors are and what that risk is that we could be facing. 
we have not built any reserve into our budget to cover what could be a potential loss of at its highest estimate, $7 million. At the lowest estimate, 3.8 million. None of that is included in our budget. And why that's concerning to us um, is if you look at our ACO performance over the last four years, you can see that the program uh, in that last column uh, cost uh, our hospital about $1.3 million to participate, um, coming through as administrative fees, some withholds for our share of funding, um, population health payments. But what's concerning about the slide is that if it weren't for years 2020 and 2021, which is our COVID years and the shutdown of services, uh, we would have suffered a loss. We did suffer a loss in 19, the first year of our performance, and again in 2022. We're hoping that 2022 is not indicative of our performance going forward. And again, that uh, risk of us suffering that loss in that risk program. Having said that, in correlation and in response to our change in mission, uh, we're, we're very deliberate. If you look at 2020 and the Medicaid settlement, you see that we were provided $2.1 million, again, related to shutdown of services with COVID. Regardless, we took $500,000 of that settlement. We have placed it in a fund to support our work with our community uh, partners in uh, care collaboration. And there's a slide that we'll talk about that a bit more. We call this the triple threat. So as Claudio alluded to, uh, we really have not performed in our budget from an operating margin perspective in the last four years. Uh, what we have been surviving on is other revenue. Uh, that other revenue is mainly our 340B program, that's our, our pharmaceutical savings and revenue program, COVID funding, and investments. Uh, each of those programs in 2023 uh, are not performing to levels that we had seen in prior years. Uh, 340B revenue, we suffered a loss of about $3 million this year due to manufacturers uh, changing the way in which uh, we can participate and requiring some extensive reporting. Uh, we are uh, going to follow those reporting rules and look to regain and recapture some of that revenue, but we won't recapture at all. Uh, COVID funding, uh, we feel from a state and federal perspective, the P PFR funding is completely exhausted. We've run all of that and, and realized all of that in our performance. Uh, not included in this budget, again, another late change, um, are FEMA uh, and FEMA uh, application grants. Uh, those rules changed in July, uh, allowing for full 100% funding uh, through the end of June, uh, and then 80% funding going forward to a date undetermined, an end date undetermined. We will be filing a third application for FEMA uh, but we don't expect a, a, you know, a, a huge windfall here. Uh, if we look at the first two applications, uh, in total, each of those uh, applications, we were awarded about $750,000. So we're anticipating less than a million dollars in that FEMA program, but nonetheless felt it was important uh, to share with you um, and, and to highlight that that was not included in the budget. From an expense standpoint, you can see um, our expenses are increasing by about $36 million from a budget of uh, $290 million to uh, $326 million. 58% of that increase uh, we are recognizing as inflation, uh, and we'll, we'll look at the, the detail behind that. Uh, the rest of that uh, relates to either volume and the care for the patients that we're providing the healthcare provider tax, so that's a 6% tax on any uh, increase in, in net revenue, as you're aware of. And then the increased participation fees in, in one care, the $1.1 million. Those are the large pieces of our um, cost structure. 
If you look at the graphs to the right, uh, expense per adjusted discharge, uh, this was deliberate in us uh, trying to get away from those COVID expenses, uh, trying to come back to a state of normalcy um, and reflected in that the, the inflation. Salary per FTE, we've also been very deliberate trying to get away from all of the COVID premium pay, incentive pay, and coming back down to um, a, a normal pay structure. Uh, that has been very, very difficult. We've got 168 open positions. It requires premium pay to ensure we have staff to take care of the patients. So in terms of that 58% of increase in our cost structure, um, about $20 million, you can see here the lineup. Um, it is very broad based. It uh, begins with our workforce inflation, includes energy costs, supply costs, our drugs, contracted staffing, um, and food. Um, this is not speculation. This is actual uh, increases that have happened for the most part, with the exception of a bit of pharmaceutical inflation projected for next year. When you look at our wage inflation, um, it is the result of a three-year contract that we have negotiated uh, with our union uh, that covers a third of our staff here. It includes uh, the, the premium or the increase in minimum wage uh, that we put into place last fall was part of that request for a midterm rate increase. <clears throat> and it includes available pricing on our medical and uh, office supplies, as well as contractual obligations, primarily with temporary staffing uh, and our energy costs. So this is real, uh, not speculation. We didn't pick numbers out of, an air, out of the air. In terms of staffing, uh, Despite inflationary uh, run up, this is where we've tried to be very deliberate in holding our cost structure. So if you look from budget to budget, even though we see extensive increases in volume, we've added 12 FTEs. And we've prioritized those FTEs for two reasons, either safety of our patients or our staff or access to care. Access to care comes through the advanced practice providers in response to some physician vacancies um, and, and being able to pr uh, provide more access to some of those specialty services. And patient safety uh, and uh, employee safety really is um, on the units um, and some of the, the, the high touch resource intensive patients that we're dealing with in response to patient safety um, and, and um, uh, staff safety. We had 149 incidents of uh, uh, staff violence this past year, 44 patients or employees were hurt. Um, and then maintenance and security. What you see here is a 17% improvement in staffing as, as measured by FTEs for adjusted occupied bed. This helps us mitigate the impact of inflation. If not for uh, this productivity management, we would see um, significantly higher requests in terms of uh, rates and inflation. Our margin trends, um, looking at uh, all we've talked about, utilization, uh, reimbursement, our cost structure, uh, you can see that over the past five years, we essentially have been a break-even organization when it comes to looking at the performance of our mission uh, to, to provide care to our patients. Where we have subsidized our mission, if you will, uh, is in our investment income, and that's the, the red portion of the graph. Um, that has been problematic over the last two years, and this year in particular, uh, driving $13 million of additional um, loss, and we're projecting uh, to try to get back to normal and break even for investments next year. Um, but this loss, um, again, is attributing to the breach in debt covenants, um, requiring that we hold investments back into um, our services here. Um, and really trying to diminish the deterioration of cash. 
And talking about capital, so uh, we have level set capital with our depreciation expense that allows us to spend about $12.8 million of capital this year. In addition to that, we do have the delay in the MRI project, a project that you approved in April or January of this year uh, that won't start in earnest in, until the fall. Um, you can see where we have um, uh, prioritized spending, uh, largely, again, relating to patient and staff safety. Uh, kitchen hoods, the OR refurbishment, both uh, safety issues for either patients or our staff, uh, security cameras and access door control, um, all uh, employee safety. When you look at, again, that strategy to try to mitigate uh, the deterioration of cash, uh, with holding capital, you see that aging of plants. This is not sustainable um, and something that we are going to need to address uh, next year. You've asked us about our certificate of needs. At this point, uh, we do not have any new uh, CONs that uh, we are planning to request of the board. However, we are currently evaluating our building workflow for efficiencies and services throughput and capacity um, for some imaging and uh, some surgical uh, volume. Uh, nothing uh, that we know of today, but certainly uh, those are on our radar screen. We do have three open CONs, the MRI we just spoke about, that's 3.1 million. We're awaiting that equipment uh, will be uh, providing updates as we move forward with that project. Our psychiatric renovations project, uh, happy to say that uh, that project is uh, for um, uh, most purposes closed, 4.1 million on budget. Uh, we will be uh, looking at the final invoicing and, and submitting a request to close that project in, uh, in the next couple of weeks. And then our medical office building project, that's been our cornerstone project over the last few years, 23.8 million. Uh, we do need to uh, delay the close of that due to a facility issue that we're dealing with in one of the uh, office locations. Having said that, we expect that project to come in under budget by about two and a half million dollars. You have asked uh, some of, about some of the work we are doing to advance diversity, uh, health equity and inclusion here at Rutland Regional and in our service area. Um, and as you could see at the outset in 2020, the Rutland Region Regional Board of Directors adopted inclusion as one of our four, diversity, equity, and inclusion as one of our four organizational values. Um, we're actively working to advance this work to figure out how to measure disparities in health equity in our service area and to address those. Um, a lot of work that's being done on this, but I think the most important piece of health equity we can do this year really rests in your, in your hands. Um, this budget is really a health equity budget. If we're not able to fund some of these programs and services, it is going to be the most vulnerable among us that are going to be impacted the most. It's not going to be the people here that have privilege that you see testifying before you. We have the means and the resources if we can't get care or services in the Rutland service area to get to Burlington or to Dartmouth or to Boston. A large part of the community that we serve here at Rutland Regional Medical Center do not have those means and that privilege. Um, so this is an important part of, of what we're doing, an important part of um, why we're at a $12 million, why we haven't made some reductions already, why we're here sustaining a $12 million operating loss. So the second piece of the presentation is really responding to information that you have provided us around our market area and our patient demographics. Um, so we did review that data and found it to be consistent uh, with data that uh, we look at on a routine basis here. 
Uh, what that data suggests um, is that our market share um, is very stable. We're consistently treating uh, over 85% of our local residents here. You see that both in the inpatient and the outpatient uh, side. In terms of Rutland County residents um, and our payer mix, you know, that high Medicare, Medicaid population uh, is reflected in our demographics. You see uh, from 2014 to 2019, we've had a 20% increase in our residents age 64 or older. It is those residents that demand more care, require more resources. We've also seen a comparable increase in the uh, patients who have one or more uh, disabilities. Um, we've seen a 16, 17% increase in that patient population. Both of those drive costs. Um, and when we look at our costs um, as was provided and look at those services where we were uh, shown to be a high cost provider, um, it's not surprising to us. It's the type of service we offer. Claudio talked to you about being a level one state psychiatric center here, uh, that drives costs. Our oncology services, uh, highly correlated with uh, pharmaceutical inflation. And um, uh, our clinic services really relate to the type of service that we provide to our patients, where we offer uh, in-office treatment rooms, testing services, but again, relates to that demographic basis with um, the, the aging um, and uh, kind of co complicated uh, patient base. So nothing that we were overly surprised with there. Looking at our wait times, um, our wait times are, are uh, highly correlated to our ability to uh, recruit and retain physicians. Uh, we have about a 14% vacancy rate in our physician basis, which is equivalent to about 11 physicians uh, that you see uh, down through uh, the areas, particularly where we have the longest lag time. Um, in response to that, it's important to know that every patient that calls seeking services to our clinics um, is triaged uh, and based on it, acuity and urgency is placed in the schedule. Um, we also, we talked about uh, the investment in advanced practice providers. Uh, when feasible and when appropriate uh, to be able to respond to a physician vacancy, we are recruiting uh, advanced practice providers to help with access to care. Um, in some instances, it's just not economically feasible uh, to look uh, for a locum tenant. Um, those uh, costs are extremely uh, high and exorbitant. Um, but each and every physician is evaluated uh, and again, uh, in, in process for recruitment. Over and above what we're seeing here, Dr. Conway is gonna to talk to you about new demand that we're seeing here in our service area, where patients outside of, of our county, of our catchment area, um, are seeking services here, whether it's in our clinics or in our ED or surgical services. Dr. Conway will talk to you about that in a moment. In terms of risks and opportunities, we'd like to share a few. Um, this is really a recap of what we've talked about this morning. So labor management, we have 186 positions, 77 RNs open, despite the fact that we invested into our workforce about $17 million last year. We have planned initiatives for childcare and housing. We're still highly dependent on traveling staff. Our budget calls for 50 or supports 50 travelers. Um, right now, we have about 70 on staff. You can see the quarterly vacancy rate. We were somewhat successful um, in the early stages of our investment in our work plan. That has since come back up. Continued inflation, we've talked about this. Really want to impress upon you, it's more than workforce, it's more than temporary staff. You can see the four slides here. Uh, high volume uh, spends for our organization. The top slide is in our supply chain where you see inflation from eight to 16% of high volume uh, medical supplies for our staff. Bottom left is our drug inflation. Uh, these drugs are used in our uh, treatment of our uh, cancer patients, our oncology patients, 
uh, Crohn's disease, um, again, high volume for us, looking at 10 to 25 percent uh, inflationary factors for this drug set, and then our uh, energy and utility inflation. Uh, natural gas, fuel oil, propane are all obligated through contracts, electricity. You know, we, we can't, uh, in the state of Vermont, have contracts in place for that, so we're not exactly sure there. And then temporary staff. Uh, temporary staff has come back down. I will tell you what we're paying today is still above what we've included in our budget. Um, we are continuing to work with uh, those agencies. We've talked about the risk of the lack of ACO reserves um, for any risk. Again, that four to $7 million risk that we could face uh, depending on performance. And it's really important to know that those cost thresholds in the ACO uh, for these risk programs are meant to cover both inflationary factors and utilization. As we're seeing here in Rutland, this high demand in utilization puts more pressure on our ability uh, to meet those cost thresholds. We're gonna talk to you about an opportunity uh, that we've invested and funded in and trying to curb that utilization. But suffice it to say, that's a long-term gain. Um, right now, we're really worried about the next uh, 12 to 18 months. That coupled with the fact that we have used our, our cash uh, to support the operating loss, again, just doesn't uh, provide uh, cash reserves as well. And the last risk we want to talk to you about is the breach of the covenant. So on, uh, by September 30th, we will be in technical default. Um, there's about $46 million of debt uh, that we will um, be at risk for. Uh, we are in discussions with our partners um, at the USDA and TD Bank who hold the debt for us um, and are looking to enter into a forbearance uh, agreement with them. Unfortunately, the forbearance agreement is likely going to require that we have an increase in our days of cash covenant. Uh, so uh, it, it will be something we'll need to consider. Again, uh, that risk is highly um, uh, managed and mitigated by our ability to create a margin, to generate a margin. Opportunities don't want to spend a whole lot of time here because we did share these with you uh, when we presented our mid-cycle uh, mid rate increase, but highly, highly involved with all aspects of uh, education here in our community, both at the high school program, trying to really promote interest in healthcare careers, adult programs, trying to uh, increase our LNAs, and then at, at the college level where we're providing faculty um, as well as uh, increasing clinical experiences and space uh, for those students to, to learn and grow in. Uh, today, I think this number has changed. I think we've had about 23 new grads uh, agree. Similarly, uh, again, recruitment, again, looking at ways in which we engage in our community and really promote health careers. And then our OR experience, where we have had a, a significant challenge in recruiting and retaining OR staff. So we've developed our own education program that involves an OR simulation. We have our own instructor really meant to help us um, uh, recruit, train uh, these new staff into the OR. The Rutland Health Alliance. So this is uh, our um, collaboration with our care providers here, uh, BNA, Community Care Network, Community Health, and Rutland Regional Medical Center. So mental health, home health, primary care in the hospital. This is the $500,000 investment that we're making uh, to promote a, a collaborative decision-making structure to really mature our care management activities with the thought um, and the goal of providing the right care at the right time in the right setting. Um, and so this, this project is underway, really meant to try to curb some of that high cost utilization in the ED. So to wrap up, uh, we understand that the budget we put before you um, is, is high cost, um, but we did that deliberately. Um, and we did that to ensure access to care. Uh, without the investments that we've made, 
we would have had to curb some services, either by hours of operation um, or delaying treatment. And so that cost, uh, if you look at the, the, the factors that are promoting access and the cost, uh, travelers are projecting a $16 million cost this year, 10 million next year. Our investment in our staff over the last 18 months, uh, a retention program, increasing minimum wage, and then the, our salary program. And all of those vacancies and open positions, our staff have come uh, and, and really uh, committed themselves, their hearts, their minds, uh, to, to our organization and to our patients. Our staff have filled 272,000 hours of vacant shifts. Uh, this is over and above what they've already committed to here at the hospital. Uh, there was incentive pay related to that uh, to really uh, ensure and, um, and recognize them for their commitment. The result is $12 million loss, a 17.8 rate increase, um, but full access to care for our, our community here. Thanks, uh, Judy. Um, now we'd like to turn it over um, first and foremost to uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Conway, uh, general surgeon, medical director of general surgery and our current medical staff president to talk a little bit about what he's um, seeing and experiencing uh, here in kind of the um, post COVID or the endemic COVID era. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Conway. Good morning. Uh, good morning to members of the board um, and to everyone in attendance this morning. My name is Matt Conway. Um, I'm medical director of our group. I'm a general surgeon. I'm also currently president of the medical staff. Um, except for two um, tours of duty, one in Afghanistan and Iraq as arm, and one in Iraq as an army surgeon, I've been here uh, in Rutland now for 23 years. Um, 10 of which in private practice and the last 13 um, employed by uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center. Um, that I've seen a, a lot of changes, obviously, um, and uh, I have a strong commitment to Vermont um, and to the Rutland community, uh, not least of which um, having raised four daughters here. Um, but I've seen some changes over the years, um, and Mr. Ford asked me to talk about those. I have a couple short examples I can share with you, which represent um, some of the challenges. Um, everybody uses the word unprecedented, um, and that is true, but frankly, they represent challenges. Um, as a hospital um, and as a provider, um, especially I'm interested in surgical services, we, um, I think, have done a good job um, of providing that care to our local community, to Rutland County and the members within the Rutland County. Um, and that's reflected by Judy's numbers with regard to the 85% catchment that comes with um, keeping those patients here that want to stay here that are appropriate for the care that we serve. Um, we have, um, interestingly, in recent history, seen um, a change in that. We've seen requests and pushes for care from outside our typical community to come here, both um, outpatient referrals. There was a time that we would outreach and try and increase our outpatient referrals. We're not, we haven't been doing that, not since COVID, but we're getting increased outpatient referrals for all of our services, frankly, is requests from patients um, and from providers outside the typical Rutland County community. Uh, which is presenting some interesting challenges for our clinics. But additionally, we're seeing some challenges from transfers from inpatient to inpatient facilities and from ER to ER facilities um, due to the fact that the current environment with pressures, those patients aren't able to be cared for um, at tertiary facilities. It's just the capacity's not been there. Um, I thought I'd share with you a couple of vignettes um, of what are frankly a myriad of examples, um, increasing number of examples that I've never seen in my 23 years here in Vermont. Um, the first one um, was a 37-year-old uh, 
woman who was 16 weeks pregnant. It was her fourth pregnancy. She presented to a hospital in northern Vermont, a small community hospital in northern Vermont, um, with what turned out to be appendicitis, and then stayed in that emergency room for what ultimately was nearly 20 hours with an inability to get her to a tertiary center, and both of our local tertiary centers were approached, um, as well as community hospitals that were of a size that were closer to her. Um, and uh, I happened to be on call the evening that I took the phone call from this emergency room doctor who was uh, not surprisingly very concerned about what he was going to do with this woman um, at, at 16 weeks pregnant. Um, there are real challenges should she go into labor, not least of which is that the fetus would not be viable. And appendicitis in and of itself is an intra-abdominal infection um, will eventually lead to labor just as a matter of course. So for us, and this speaks to one of our challenges, for us, receiving that phone call put me in a difficult position. Because <clears throat> keep in mind, um, while we're the second largest hospital in Vermont, we are a community hospital. And we are, compared to the nation, a relatively small community hospital, 100 plus beds. But we are finding increasingly being asked to provide service um, that one would say would be beyond our typical scope of practice. Um, we, we thankfully have the capacity to do that in some respects, but it presents challenges for us in terms of what we should do. So I accepted this woman in transfer after speaking to our local OB service, keeping in mind that we don't have a NICU, we don't have high-risk OB, but this woman is, the clock is ticking um, with regard to the development of labor for her. Um, and ultimately ended up operating on her at 2.30 in the morning for what was by that time a ruptured appendix um, with a very high risk of progression to labor and loss of the fetus. Um, we were fortunate, or I should say she was fortunate, and we were fortunate that, that that did not occur. We did the surgery. She recovered from the surgery. She stayed with us for a few days on antibiotics um, and ultimately was sent back to the small community hospital, which keep in mind is three hours north of us, three hours north of us um, for that care, three hours by land transport, ambulance transport, at least on the evening that she came to us. Um, that, that's an example of care that we would not typically be expected to provide. In fact, that is someone that we would typically look to transfer from our facility to a place where there is high risk care available. Um, that's one example of, uh, I've got more than a dozen easily in the last year. Um, but additionally, here's, I have a separate example of some of the challenges we face with regard to getting patients from us, again, a relatively small community hospital providing community care to a higher level of care. And again, this is an example of mine. It's easiest when I speak to things that I know closest, although I'm familiar with some of the other care issues. but. You know, I found myself of an evening being called by our emergency room with a gentleman with a necrotizing infection. Um, that's a, they use the vernac, popular vernacular flesh eating bacteria, but a necrotizing infection. He had a BMI, uh, uh, let's just say his weight was nearly 500 pounds. And this gentleman presented in extremis septic with a necrotizing infection at 12 30 1 o'clock at night to our hospital which has on-call uh, nursing services for emerg surgical emergencies is myself an anesthesiologist on call and i was fortunate enough to have a physician's assistant available that night typically that patient would be appropriate to go to a tertiary facility sadly the ter one tertiary facility turned us down to outright and the second one told us that they would like to take the patient, but they did not have capacity and this patient needed an operation. I found myself again about three o'clock in the morning operating on a patient, myself and a PA on someone who was 500 pounds, floridly septic, with no, with limited resources, thankfully we have an ICU. We, we got through the surgery, it was difficult. Was that the best care for the patient? I would say, I would argue that that's not the case. And sadly, the challenges for us is that this is 
increasingly becoming the norm for us um, as the second largest hospital in Vermont, keeping in mind that we are what we are. Um, and I don't see it changing. I see an increase in those requests. Um, and you can say, well, from an outpatient standpoint, you could shunt those patients, you know, who request to come to us for an elective stuff. But what do you do for the inpatients that can't get to the higher level of care? We find ourselves becoming the receiving line as the next level, um, not at our request, but as a consequence of the care that's necessary that needs to be provided to these people um, that we are unable to arrange for their care in other places. So these are some challenges that we face. Um, and I don't have a solution for it, but I can tell you it definitely puts pressure on our facility. Um, it puts pressure on our staff. Um, and I would say for most of these examples, and I have others, um, they would exceed what I would consider to be the average scope of our practice, but it's become increasingly the scope of our practice here in Rutland. So that, that's, that's what I have to share. Thank you, Dr. Connolly. Appreciate that. Um, Courtney, you want to take the next uh, piece? Sure. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Courtney Collins. I'm one of our clinical managers here in the emergency department at Rowland. Um, and similar to Dr. Conway, uh, this is my home. I grew up here. I was born here. I'm raising my children here. Um, so this is very meaningful to me, too. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys about workplace violence and the impact on our, on our staff. Um, I think it's important to recognize that as a rural emergency department, we are often the only resource our community members have. And we're certainly the only resource that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and every day of the year. Um, and we take this mission very seriously, and we're very proud of the work we, we do here in, in the emergency room. Um, and since COVID, we have seen, I'm going to use the word, unprecedented <laughs> volumes <laughs> and complexity in our department. Um, we are frequently severely and dangerously overcrowded. Um, and our wait times are long. And that in turn causes our patients to be tired, frustrated, and have diminished coping, or coping skills. So as you can imagine, overcrowded ER, busy, long waits, our patients um, have a propensity for aggression and our ED staff is an easy target. Every day we are having incidences where patients are raising their voice, they're using um, expletives, threatening, threatening language. Sometimes they are um, posturing in threatening ways and even acting out with violence towards our staff. And not only do our staff have to endure these events, they have to remain engaged in patient care. Um, they have to be willing to de-escalate these patients and their family members, just as they would have to care for patients with traumas, heart attacks, strokes, or other life and limb threatening injuries. Since January, and you see the number in our, I should say our, Judy's PowerPoint, um, 44 incidences. And I just want to impress upon you the significance of those incidences. Um, we have had a highly publicized case where one of our very pregnant nurses was assaulted. She was punched in her very pregnant belly before being knocked to the ground. But we've also had staff members sustain significant injuries with broken bones one requiring a surgical intervention. Um, and our staff witnessing these verbal, physical, sexual, and emotional violence is causing our staff to reconsider their career. Uh, our staff are burning out and they're leaving. Um, last week, we've had two full-time employees give their notice. Um, so we utilize you know, very expensive travelers to augment our staff. Our leadership team is working weekends, nights, and holidays to help staff our department safely. But it's it's a real challenge that we're facing. Um, if you ask our staff, I would say every single member of our team has been assaulted in some way, and I bet they would all tell you that it's been within a week that they've experienced them. It's that frequent. There's a risk with every career, of course, um, but it is getting harder to ask our team to come to work every day, knowing that they may and will be verbally or even physically assaulted. 
Um, and that's a really hard thing for us right now. And as I said, this community is our home. We're caring for each other's family and friends. And so the stakes of this feel really high. Um, and I can't imagine doing the work that we do with less. Um, I can't fathom how that will impact our staff or our patients. Um, we are working really hard every day to provide excellent care for them. Um, but I'm just worried that the impact of this on our staff, um, we are caring for them despite some of them kicking, biting, punching, or spitting on us. I will continue to care for them no matter how they present, but um, my fear is our staff are gonna continue to leave. And I'm afraid that without the resources we need, that we'll be unable to fulfill our mission and care for the most vulnerable members of our community uh, when they need it the most. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> And we'll wrap it up on our end with uh, Dr. Allison Davis. Dr. Davis. Good morning. Um, thank you for the privilege of speaking with all of you today. Uh, my name is Allison Davis. I'm the medical director of the emergency department um, here in Rutland. I um, came here from um, Boston. I graduated from Harvard Medical School. I finished my emergency medicine residency in 2009 at Mass General Brigham. Um, I've been at Rutland Regional for 11 years, and I've been the medical director since May. Um, as Judy alluded, um, our goal at the hospital, but especially in the emergency department, is to be providing to the, the right care um, at the right time and the right place. Um, we're committed to both quality and to innovation that will increase the value in the care we deliver. At the same time, we're committed to serving our community and our greater catchment area with services that they may not have the resources to access elsewhere. Over the past 12 months, we've seen that our patients need us and the services that we provide uh, more than ever. Um, and this year's 20% increase in emergency department visits reflects that. Our department is being asked to hold and care for psychiatric patients, nursing home patients, and patients waiting for beds either um, at another facility or waiting for transportation to get to that facility. On top of that, we remain ready to care for the next trauma patient or the next child with a mental health crisis. We need your support to preserve access to high quality care. I wanna share a couple stories that illustrate what our days are like in the ED, but also some of the steps that we're taking to address these challenges. Um, as Dr. Conway alluded to, tertiary care centers are, are almost always full. Um, and when we say that we're being asked to care for sicker patients here, in addition to the surgical patients Dr. Conway described, um, to give you one example, we now regularly admit patients here in Rutland who are actively having heart attacks, despite the fact that we do not have the interventional capabilities to address those patients' problems. Um, and that's because of a lack of space um, and ability to transfer. So we're left hoping um, that those patients that we're going to be able to keep them stable here while they're awaiting transfer to a tertiary care hospital um, where they can get the definitive treatment they need. Um, but I can tell you that it certainly keeps me up at night worrying about outcomes. Um, often those tertiary care centers agree that our patients need to be transferred, again, as Dr. Conway mentioned, but they're still not able to help us in the short term. Um, so I took care of a patient not long ago with a bleeding tumor in her esophagus. Um, controlling that type of catastrophic bleeding requires a, a level of interventional radiology and thoracic surgery that we don't offer here in Rutland. Um, I called 11 hospitals that night, um, including every tertiary care hospital in Massachusetts, and uh, without success. Um, fortunately, during the many hours the patient was in the emergency department, the bleeding subsided uh, because we really had no option except to admit the patient here for observation. Um, it was a very scary, scary evening. Um, nonetheless, in the emergency department, we're taking proactive steps to improve the care of boarding patients and to further the appropriate use of the emergency department. So one troubling trend that we've noticed is that the 
um, the volume of pediatric patients presenting to the ED for suicidal ideation is up 12.5%. Um, at the same time, the average weight for a psychiatric bed for those children has gone from less than two days in 2018 to over five days now. So we are currently working uh, to partner with the Brattleboro Retreat to develop a telepsychiatry program to provide consults for the children who are boarding in our emergency department waiting for beds at the retreat. And our hope is that with that intervention, we'll be able to decrease the length of stays for those patients in the ED and to decrease inpatient utilization of beds at the retreat. Um, at the same time in this area, and you know, in a, a rural part of the state, access to pediatric psychiatric care is a real challenge. And our hope is that uh, with this service, we're gonna have a larger positive impact on our community. Um, we're also actively collaborating, as Judy mentioned, with the, um, our FQHC locally, so with the community health centers of the Rutland region. Um, and we have a program in place now to identify high utilizers of the emergency department and to look for ways to tailor outpatient interventions to decrease their reliance on the emergency department. And that program is already bearing fruit. I can give you a positive example of a patient who is coming in almost every night to the emergency department with anxiety. Um, we were able to identify that patient to collaborate with the patient's out, outpatient providers to increase services in the patient's home. Um, and the patient's visits to the ED have fallen dramatically since we were able to put those processes in place. Um, these are really the types of projects that excite us because they increase the value of the care that we deliver um, while improving outcomes for our community. And I would love to be able to come back to you and report on further successes that we have. Um, right now, though, we need your help uh, to provide for our vulnerable patients here in the Rutland community, and we ask for your support today. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Davis. So, folks, uh, this is not where we want to be right now, but it's where we are. And typically, if you know, and those of you who have been here year after year, you know Rutland Regional has always tried to play it straight and comply with the guidance and the guidelines of the Green Mountain Care Board. We have done that. Um, and typically, when we don't get exactly what we ask for, we're able to find some, some way to make up the difference, to make sure these folks to my left are supported and have the resources they need to do their jobs. But we simply at this point in time, this critical point in time, don't have any more rabbits to pull out of our hat. If we did, we would have done it back when we came to you back mid-year and made those adjustments. We sustained as a leadership, myself as the CEO, um, probably one of the most unprecedented operating losses in the history of this hospital. Um, our board, re you know, this was a very difficult budget for Judy and her staff to put together and for us as management to come up with and to go to our board with, because ultimately they have the leaders of Casella Waste Management, of Foley Services, of smaller businesses that are doing really innovative things in the space like Ann Clark Cookie Cutters uh, and major health and social service players in our community are on our board. They unanimously approved this budget because they recognized, um, they, they understand the impact of this cost, but I think they also understand the cost of not being able to provide these services we believe will be much greater. And they won't be known until we get there. And by that time, once you lose a service in a rural delivery system under these pressures, it is, I would say impossible to, to reestablish or very difficult. So that's our story this morning, folks. I'll, I'll uh, turn it back to you, uh, Madam Chair, and um, Dr. Conway has a couple more minutes left for us. So if you had any specific questions for him, um, I will turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so very much. Um, thank you for the presentation. Clearly, thank you for the hard work you're doing for your community during these challenging times. Uh, you know, we keep saying, should we use the word unprecedented? But frankly, I'm not sure there is a better word than unprecedented. <laughs> so I uh, just want to acknowledge that. And also just want to appreciate and um, acknowledge that collaborative nature of your redefined mission statement. I think it's an excellent example of, of the direction that we're hoping to move in the state. So I was really happy to see that. Um, I guess I would ask if there's any board members that have any questions for Dr. Conway, maybe we should ask them now. Uh, and then I was going to suggest a slight uh, recess so that folks can stretch and have a bio break and then we, we can return to, to board questions. So does any board member have a question for Dr. Conway before he has to leave and care for patients? No, no question from me. This is Tom Walsh. I just wanted to thank Dr. Conway for joining us and um, giving us more insight into uh, his day to day. Robin, do you have any? I was gonna, I'm not sure if this uh, is for Dr. Conway, so I'll mention it and then uh, the Rutland team can tell me how they wanna take it. But I was interested in getting, in the narrative, there was information included about discussions related to hospital at home care. Um, and I was interested in getting more information and details on that. So if that's something we need Dr. Conway for, I wanted to raise it. And if not, happy to hold it till afterwards. Yeah, I think it's more of an initiative, um, Member Lunge, that we've been doing um, from our hospital medicine service. Uh, we don't have our leaders here today from that, but we started looking that, at, at that during the crisis phase of the pandemic as a stopgap measure at first. But then I think what we're seeing is, um, you know, through any type of crisis, you see some innovations that really spark some innovations like what we're doing right here as we speak um, that we would never have done previously. And so we're looking at how could we adopt that to um, uh, free up beds, break down the cost of care, and that is exactly the type of work that we're trying to create this Rutland Health Alliance clinically integrated network to be able to explore these opportunities and, and, and accelerate them more than we can do on our own. Do you want me to say anything about the return program? Yeah, Dr. Okay. Dr. Davis might have a... So uh, I can share... Um, one program that I think has the idea is that this would be sort of the framework that we would use. So during COVID, we were really concerned about capacity, about our ability to transfer patients, and um, was there a way to be able to identify a subset of COVID positive patients that could be cared for at home? And it was um, it was really great initiative. And once we kind of had the framework in place, we thought, well, we've done all this work and would we be able to leverage this going forward? Um, but the idea was that we, we have a good transitional care team here at the hospital with RNs who reach out to patients at home. So we were collaborating with the, our transitional care team um, visiting nurses. Um, we were utilizing telehealth services and our hospital medicine providers to do telemedicine visits to the patients in their home. Um, we partnered with um, the medical equipment uh, to make sure that patients had the oxygen and the medications that they needed in the home. Um, and then just a really tight follow-up plan to make sure that patients were improving um, and that we knew how we were gonna get them back to the hospital if they weren't doing well at home. Um, it ended up that we didn't have quite the capacity concerns that we necessarily needed. We were able to flex in the hospital and utilize kind of all available space. So it wasn't utilized as much as maybe, uh, which is a good thing, I think, because in terms of sort of how we fared during the past 18 months, but we could certainly see how a program like that might be really beneficial in the long run for patients with, for example, COPD, um, sort of chronic lung issues, chronic heart failure. And so we're looking to uh, kind of build on that, the success of that program um, moving forward. Thank you, that's super helpful. I'm, it, it's a very interesting concept and I'm, it's very exciting that you're exploring it. 
So I think that would the only one that I was worried might touch on Dr. Conway from me. So Tom Pelham, did you have any questions for Dr. Conway? I don't except to say thank you for um, uh, bringing me who uh, is 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 not in an operating room. Uh, the experiences that you see quite often of um, extraordinary magnitude. And it's just as you're looking through spreadsheets, it's also very important to have all that in the back of your mind um, as to uh, you know um, how this money serves your purpose. Um, then I guess that's just for me, left for me. And I just have one question for you, Dr. Conway. You you know your stories about the increasing number of transfers that are coming from other areas of the state and the requests to expand your scope of practice are really compelling. And I'm just wondering if the new uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock bed expansion will relieve some of those pressures um, as they you know, add 65 new beds and potentially more tertiary care capacity. Do you see that as any relief? Uh, we haven't to this point. Um, in fact, of, of our two tertiary facilities uh, that we go to when we are looking for assistance, um, we've I mean, just historically, we have found recently more obstacles with regard to getting patients from here to Dartmouth than we have getting patients to UVM. I would hope that that would represent increased capacity, but amongst some of the patients we have accepted and transfer on well, more than one occasion have been people within the Dartmouth network at, at facilities that were part of the Dartmouth group. Um, and so to this point, I can't say that we have um, seen a, um, that serving, um, that increased capacity serving us um, in terms of decreasing the pressure. Um, yeah, I, I, I would hope that that'll be the case. Like I know that that's, yeah, I know that that's a big initiative. So one would hope that that would alleviate some of that. Yeah, always looking for the the glass half full hope in the future. So I think they're not the, I think the construction ends this fall and the beds will be open sometime in 23. So just, you know, to the degree, is that gonna help? Sounds like may or may not. You know, I, I will comment also that we are fortunate, um, unlike other places I've been where it's a lot more cutthroat and competitive. And if you're not in the network, you don't get the, you know, people don't give you much um, credence. Um, both Dartmouth and UVM, we're an independent hospital, but both of them work very closely with us and partner with us. And so we don't see that we're, because we're not a network hospital in the Dartmouth or UVM system that they're saying, you know, we're not going to take your patients or so forth. So we're very fortunate in that regard. And I don't think every, I know that not every, uh, area of the country is in that situation. Well, I mean, and so to your point, that's part of what makes it unprecedented, right? Because we have good relationships with those who've never had these issues before. And we've just not had those issues before. And and it's, it is not that there's been a breakdown in our communication with them. It's been strictly a capacity issue on their end, an inability uh, to provide that care. And so consequently, it represents an increased pressure on us. That's not surprisingly a downstream consequence of that. Makes total sense. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I think what we'll do now is, if there are no objections, we'll just take a 10 minute recess and we'll come back at 10 10. Getting some feedback. I'm not sure who maybe could be muting. If everybody could mute themselves, that will help. I'm going to ask it. Thank you. Uh, so if there's no objections, I'm going to ask for a 10 minute recess. We'll allow folks to stretch their eyes and walk around a bit and we'll come back at 1010 and I'll start off with uh, board questions for the Rutland team. Okay, see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you. All right, it's 1010. I see the Rutland team is back. Thank you. I see Tom Walsh. I see Robin Lund. Tom Pelham, are you on? Not seeing your face, but you're out oh, there's Tom great I see Tom and the court reporter I assume you are on too yes I am here perfect thank you very very much okay so with that I think I will turn it over to board members for their other questions and I'm going to start with uh, board member lunch hi all um 
Good to see you this morning and thank you for being here. And as always, thank you for a very clear and thorough presentation. Um, I really appreciate that. You've very clearly outlined your financial uh, assumptions and uh, the rationales behind the assumptions, as well as providing us with some stories and context that help us uh, to Tom's point, see beyond the spreadsheet. So I very much appreciate that. Um, so as a result, I only have a, a, like two or three questions, not a lot. Um, in your budget, it looks like um, you've budgeted a decrease in your traveler usage from um, projected, and as well as some, as you mentioned, Judy, some changes in the, the current COVID-related wage structure. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the balancing act there. What we've heard from a lot of the other hospitals um, is that they've really focused on the wage aspect in an effort to reduce the travelers. So um, just wondering about how you thought about that tension and how you came to an, a balance there. Sure, so um, this is a risk in our budget. Um, we uh, had, um, projected that our traveler utilization would be around 50 at this time. Um, and that was really based on that occupancy percentage going down that we showed you on that slide. Uh, with that tick back up, we've got some work to do. Um, and so we've got work to do in retention and recruitment, um, and we have kind of a full court press there. Um, we also have some uh, work in terms of uh, negotiating payments with our uh, travel resource companies. Uh, we've included about $100 an hour um, in, in the budget. And when you look at new contracts coming uh, in play now, they're about 120. So um, both, both fronts. Um, we have uh, tried to balance travelers with investment in our staff. Uh, we have looked at market studies um, and tried to be, um, you know, not not ahead of the pack, but certainly uh, midstream. Uh, and we have, at, at this point, uh, to our advantage, a union contract that's in play for, for uh, another two years. So that gives us some predictability there. Um, we have increased our market budget, uh, knowing that we have some very high profile, hard to fill positions, both clinically and from a senior administration position, uh, that they are very hard to recruit. Um, and so we have tried to uh, provide more funding there to give us kind of uh, more of a leg up in those recruitment efforts. I, I think also to add on to what Judy said, Member Lunge, is um, we're doing a lot of work uh, trying to mitigate workplace violence. Um, it is one of the biggest initiatives we have. Uh, I was asked by a reporter a couple months ago who said, Claudio, how do you expect nurses to come in to the emergency department day after day in the face of this? And I said, clearly, I don't. It's not acceptable. It's not why they went into taking care of people. Um, we are doing everything we can to protect them and to mitigate those issues. Um, we are also pursuing um, housing and childcare, two big issues, but we wanna be careful that we don't get out over our skis. They're also very resource intensive issues that are not a hospital's typical core business. We've got to figure out how to do it, but how to do it in an economically um, rational way that doesn't exacerbate some of the challenges we're having right now. Sorry about that, I was muted. Uh, thank you, and I am very sorry to hear about the workplace violence issues. That just must be incredibly, incredibly difficult for your staff, and I'm, I'm just terribly sorry about that. Um, Another area that I wanted to just get your thoughts on is in the qualified health plan um, process, in premium process, we heard some data around um, utilization and the impacts of COVID surges. And I've just been asking hospitals whether this is something that they've been seeing just to get a sense of how this, the 
how th that particular analysis for that particular population, whether that's holding true more broadly or not. And that data showed that um, with increase in COVID cases, there was a reduction in utilization, but primarily in urgent care and ED, and that other utilization for outpatient or um, surgery, you know, pretty much over time uh, evened out. Um, but really, of course, the reduction in ED or urgent care, if people don't go, they're, they may have a more acute episode, but they're not going to postpone their ED visit and then go two months later, for example, for the same thing. Um, so I was just curious if you saw any of that in your utilization data, if that sounds uh, similar to what your experience or really not at all. I can start. Yeah, yeah, so um, our ED is extremely busy. We have not seen um, any relief there. Um, if you look at our last couple of months and you project that going forward, we'll have over 30,000 ED visits this year. Um, so we have not seen that, um, you know, quietening, quietening, if you will, in our ED. Yeah. Um, we have uh, some wait times in surgical services. Uh, both room capacity and uh, workforce capacity. Uh, and so we we don't see any change there um, in, in the near term. Um, we're running um, you know, as, as full as we can with the staff in the room that we have. So I think that uh, volume has been fairly consistent. Where we have seen a slight change um, is in our inpatient admissions. Um, they've been down a little bit. But you're not going to see that in our utilization and our census data because what we're seeing is patients are staying longer. Uh, so for yeah. instance, last month, uh, we the, the impact of length of stay was that we had seven additional patients every day. Um, Great, thank you. Um, and then, oh, sorry, no, go no, ahead. You can just talk a little bit, Dr. Davis. Oh, um, so. ED volumes definitely went down at the beginning portion of the pandemic, but they've been rising steadily since then and are, are back at pre-pandemic levels. What's different is the acuity of the patients that are coming in. So um, the number of what we would call non-urgent visits to the emergency department is down 27%, um, but making up that difference is um, what we would call urgent or semi-urgent kind of patients, and those patients require more resources. So it's kind of the difference between somebody showing up with a um, infected toenail versus somebody showing up with abdominal pain or chest pain. Um, it's just much more a resource-intense visit to the emergency department, and that translates into longer lengths of stay in the ED. And, and, and one last thing to round that out is um, we're actually being impacted by our staff right now more than patients. So, um, you know, you don't notice it here because our policy is if we're all comfortable and we're in a secluded room, we can be unmasked. But once we walk out that door, we're going to mask up. And in the emergency department, they're continuously wearing masks and we continue to revise our protocols. But still, COVID is such reps spreading so rapidly that we oftentimes on any given day we have between 10 or 20 staff that are out with COVID mm -hmm. and where we've been impacted on urgent care is a, a couple of weeks ago we had an urgent care uh, clinic and some primary care clinics close suddenly and abruptly because their staff all contracted COVID mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden that creates an incredible um, surge of patients that show up at unpredictable times. Uh, we kind of know the cadence and the seasonality of, of ED uh, volumes, right? But this adds a measure of uncertainty that we've never seen before when that when that happens. Thank you. That's very helpful <clears throat> to have a have that picture. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to I've been asking all hospitals around about cost savings initiatives and Judy you had mentioned both uh, the 17 percent increase in productivity which uh, addresses 
um, some of the budget issues. And also, I think in your materials, there was a, a little less than 500,000 uh, cost savings budgeted, plus, of course, uh, travelers and, and wage stuff. So I just wanted to make sure that I didn't miss anything in the materials. And if that sounds about right, um, and of course, interested in anything else you'd like to add on that topic. Sure, yes, so the $500,000 is really a result of our partnership with Vizient uh, for group purchasing for both our medical supplies, some office supplies, and pharmaceuticals. We're very active on their boards, uh, both from a purchasing standpoint and a pharmaceutical standpoint, also an, an administrative standpoint. Um, we take advantage of any program that we think is appropriate and relevant uh, to, to the hospital. So those savings are all associated with our participation in those programs. But you're right, the, the, the cornerstone savings was really in productivity. Um, and, and that's you know based on the commitment of our staff um, and that those volumes without matching and, and increasing workforce. Thank you. Um, I'm all set, Jess. Great, thanks. And I will turn it over to board member Pelham. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, mirror Robin here for a very thorough um, and nuanced uh, presentation. Uh, you, you, you always do that well, and you did it well here, telling it, telling your story. Um, <clears throat> my first question has to do with uh, Medicaid. Um, in the payer mix table, um, it profiled an 18.2% increase in Medicaid. And in the rec one of the reconciliation tables, I think table one, it profiled a 17.4% increase. But as well, you've, you've uh, kind of indicated that you don't expect any reimbursement um, in Medicaid rates so that um, any increases that we're looking at are utilization based and so um so i'm just wondering and that stands out to me because if you look at across all hospitals the expectation about increased medicaid revenues um in 2023 is 1.4 percent and uh so i'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you see driving the medicaid utilization uh revenues sure so our Medicaid population um, is uh, highly correlated with um, our participation in one care. Um, and although we see trend factors there, those trend factors have to support both inflation and utilization. We're seeing utilization outpace um, what the trends are uh, provided in um, and the one care program and those cost thresholds. So that's the primary piece. Uh, the, the other piece is just in the services that we provide um, and those uh, benefit structures that Medicare, uh, or Medicaid, I'm sorry, uh, pays for, for those services. Uh, physician services, uh, highly correlated uh, with some of the increase um, and, and there isn't any reimbursement increase for those types of services. Um, but, but also, uh, Member Pelham, I think what you're looking at, that 17% is a budget to budget change. And we've seen, you know, from, the, from our last year's budget to this year's actual, and now which becomes next year's budget, um, we've seen higher utilization. Patients are flooding back and they are sick and they are anxious and they've got a lot of mental health, substance abuse and, and deferred medical issues. So we're seeing we're seeing some of that utilization come back more than we had predicted in last year's budget. So it sounds like it's a combination of um, attributed lives and um, and people coming back um, of, uh, with uh, higher degrees of illness because of the pandemic. Kind of the, the trying to put it away in a in my simplistic mind. Um, so let me ask you this, uh, and this is kind of, a, I, I don't think it's a political question. I think it's uh, a practical question, but in the last legislative session, uh, 2023, the Medicaid budget for global commitment was reduced, actually reduced. And there was a rationale for it. It wasn't just a cut. It was 
uh, it was based on um, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of. It, it, it was based on uh, fewer numbers of Medicaid patients to, uh, uh, statewide. And I'm just wondering if if you engage at all in the legislative process when it comes to um, trying to uh, un undo what Judy kind of has said is a is is a leveling of Medicaid rates, um, you know, by the state. Yeah. Um, I, let me I, let me just finish that. I, yeah. I I I worry that the Medicaid is just become kind of a background thing that people feel there's nothing that they can do about it um, because it's kind of a background cost shift. It's really not that visible. Yeah. Well, it's certainly, as you know, it certainly is visible to you as our regulator and us as, and Judy, especially in trying to balance the budget and what we're doing. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for the agency of human services, but I will tell you, I've been around for a while and I've seen our new uh, secretary of AHS uh, really trying to understand the needs on the front lines and find resources to support uh, that. And the challenges are incredible because not only does the, the acute care hospital community have incredible needs, so do the nursing facilities, so do the mental health agencies, so do the home care agencies through, I, I have no idea why the, why CMS is going to cut home care at this juncture um, and devastate our home care system. It makes, you know, maybe it's something that we got put into place a long time ago, but it makes no sense and will be very um, challenging as we try to continue this long recovery from the pandemic. So we're, we're at the table, Member Pelham, and um, outlining what the challenges we, we're at. Clearly, there's not going to be enough money to go around. You, you, I've heard you say that your concerns and so forth. Um, hopefully, we are able to get some some Medicaid relief and to hopefully temper some of the incredible cost shifts that we're experiencing. So, my, my next two questions are um, kind of bean counting questions. Um, but I, I just, uh, I don't fully understand the increase in the ACO dues from four hundred thousand dollars to one point two million. Um, I, I, I see the numbers on, uh, you know, um, you know, in the spreadsheet, uh, in in the income statement, but I, I don't understand why that would be as a big an increase in one year. Yes, so uh, part of it is a structural change in how the ACO is um, collecting uh, fees for uh, PMPM payments. Uh, they used to be a withhold and not included as part of administrative fees. And we didn't budget that way last year. So if you're looking budget to budget, that is the most significant change. We do have an increase in lives um, and, and uh, an increase in net revenue, which is how the uh, ACO fees are assessed. Okay, so it's 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 not something that really affects the bottom line. It's more of an accounting uh, change. Is that fair? Uh, there is a, a piece of growth in that revenue, uh, which is used to assess fees um, as okay. well as attribution. Um, but there there's a significant piece of that that's a, a reclass from a, a withhold to an expense. And I have one more bean counting one is just uh, wondering why the uh, <clears throat> revenues uh, from cafeteria and parking revenues went up 47%. It's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a very small number um, financially, but just, it's a very big percentage. And was, <laughs> I see a big number like that. I have to ask about it. Yeah. So we, we closed our cafeteria during COVID. And so our cafeteria is is open um, and accepting both employees and visitors. Yeah, makes sense to me. Um, my next question has to do with uh, uh, kind of the pace of. I mean, I, I we're living in a very volatile time. I mean, none of us have any uh, have any really kind of tight risk about what we think about what's going on. There's still a whole bunch to be revealed. Um, and I'm, uh, I look back at your operating margins in 2020, 
uh, you were at two tenths of one percent, uh, which is um, five hundred and forty five thousand um, dollars. Although you did have a large non operating revenue back then of fifteen million, which is is not what you're experiencing um, now. But I'm just wondering, you know, there there are things that are have yet to unfold. There's the hospital sustainability process. There's um, the uh, execution of the new 1115 waiver. There's um, the recommendations of the Healthcare Workforce Advisory Group um, <clears throat> that just came out in well October of uh, 2021, and hopefully maybe continued mitigation of the pandemic kind of a. Uh, uh, on its own. And I'm wondering whether or not uh, it would be reasonable to say to hospitals, say to Rutland, look, we got to get you in the black. Um, in 2023, we got to get you in the black. But it might not be the 2.6% um, you're looking for. It might be, you know, I mean, you know, back in 2020, it was two tenths of a percent. So let's say a half a percent or nine tenths of a percent, but something less less than where we're at now. Well, I mean, I'm sure your reaction to that would not be favorable, but how unfavorable would it be? So I'll start with the numbers response, and then Claudio can uh, can follow up. Um, the 2.7% operating margin um, was something very deliberate, and it's based on our cash flow needs. Um, and we felt it is uh, extremely important that we stop uh, the uh, decrease in um, the underfunding of um, our operations uh, and the negative impact that that has on cash. That coupled with the fact that we are working on a forbearance plan, not knowing where that days of cash uh, requirement will land. And so the, the margin is really a product of sources and uses of cash and cash flow. And, and, and I would also say you have the data, if you look back over the past six years, in 2017, Rutland Regional did the unprecedented thing of reducing our rates by 6%. 2018, 2019, 2020 were basically break even years. We had a little bit of relief, and paradoxically, in 2021, because of the COVID federal relief and state relief funding. Um, but this year, it's that all of that has been taken up and then some by our loss. I can't speak for our board of directors other than to say that they're concerned about the financial situation and the bigger picture of sustainability for this hospital. And, and we, we don't think, I think, um, you know, if you look across the country, uh, I mean, I guess right now is an unprecedented time, but uh, two and two point seven five percent is not. We're not asking for ten percent operating margins. We're not looking for five or five or six percent, which A-rated hospitals and systems typically, at least in the pre pre-COVID era, that was kind of the benchmark. We're looking for not even three percent because, as Judy said, we think that's where we need to be to stabilize this year. Fundamentally. The, the work that needs to be done and the work that you're going to be leading and so forth, Rutland Regional will be at the table in good faith, rolling up our sleeves to try to advance healthcare payment, fundamental payment and delivery reform. We've been there with the, our participation in the all payer model and the ACO, and it's tremendously important for us to continue that work. However, I don't think we're asking for, um, you know, this is really kind of what we feel, playing it straight like we have what we need to sustain. So I don't know what will what the situation would be if we're not able to at least try to do that. And and that three two point seven five percent, as you saw Judy outline, has a number of risks in there, more risks than opportunities. So. And my final, thank you for that. I, um, I mean, I, I don't expect the concept to be embraced, but I'm just looking to, <laughs> to uh, find out what the range of uh, opportunity might be. Um, 
So my final has to do with travelers and that you're looking in 2023 and I, and sometimes I'll, I get this wrong because it's very hard sometimes given the way uh, hospitals have presented the travel information to know, you know, where the all in number is. Um, but I think I, I found it in yours where you're looking at um, a $10.4 million traveler's request in 2023, and that's down from an $18.6 million uh, projected budget for uh, 2022. Um, and as we've gone through this process, uh, I, there, there's been some hospitals that have kind of taken surprising approaches to travelers. Uh, uh, Southwestern isn't budgeting anything for travelers. They're basically have taken the, the the approach of investing in their staff, um, and, uh, and but also have taken a big risk with that too, uh, which they readily admit. Um, up in Northwestern, uh, they have um, an approach where people um, uh, on their staff, their permanent staff, are allowed to leave and go do some traveling work to take advantage of of the good times, uh, but are guaranteed um, to. Uh, have a position when they come back. Um, so maybe they work a quarter of a year on the traveler um, circuit and uh, come back. And so I'm just wondering, what is it behind your efforts, uh, you know, in Rutland to bring that number down uh, from 18.6 million down to 10.4? Do, uh, do, do, do you have a strategic plan behind that? Or is it just... Uh, you know, kind of a, you know, a broad projection. So the biggest piece of that is rates. And uh, that 18 million that you know, we're talking about current year um, is related to rates uh, at the height of the pandemic where uh, an ED nurse was over $200 an hour. Um, so we're seeing uh, significant relief in rates. That's what's driving the uh, decrease in cost. As I said, we still are projecting a slight decrease in utilization to 50. Uh, we're around 70. Um, and that's where our retention and recruitment, uh, primarily with higher ed, uh, our Grow Your Own programs uh, are coming into play as well. We're um, supporting 10 students here uh, to engage and, and enroll in um, nursing practice, um, and we're providing flexible schedules um, and uh, support for uh, educational costs. But <clears throat> the major piece in, in, in full transparency is rate relief. So did you, uh, just this one follow-up, so did you, uh, so what you're saying, I think, is that you're seeing a decline in traveler rates. Um, and so did you budget based on what the rate currently is now and not what it was six months ago, but currently now, or did you uh, project a continued decline going forward? Yeah, so this is a risk in our budget. We have um, based traveler rates at about $100 an hour. Um, if you look at current rates today, they're about 120. So we, we've well, seen that. Thank Thank, thank you. I, uh, I always find your presentations uh, thoughtful and uh, uh, answers that make sense uh, uh, given. And so thank you very much for that. And I'll pass it back to Jess. Great. Thank you, Tom. And so I'll pass it over to Board Member Walsh. Thank you, Jess. And good morning. And uh, thank you, Nurse Collins and Dr. Davis for joining us um, and sharing your experiences. As the other board members have said, it, it does help to um, you know, give some context um, around the spreadsheets. Um, I also, I wanted to um, salute your presentation, but also just, it really comes through in your voices and your stories, your commitment to your community. And I wanna recognize that. Um, your commitment to being innovative, the, the regional alliance that you're working with. And um, I think it was Robin who pointed out the, the hospital at home care model that you're diving into. I think those things are terrific. Um, also the justice, equity, diversity and inclusion work. Um, it, it, and it, it's, 
in there that I have I have some concerns that part of the struggle that we're doing uh, with the board is to balance uh, these concerns. We certainly don't want um, healthcare providers um, going out of business or bankrupt or the community members that they serve. And I, I, I worry that the higher prices that are um, part of this year's budget cycle, those get passed on through insurance companies uh, and are felt as increased out-of-pocket expenses by the community members. And some of our community members are already struggling, right? And they're already the uh, mental health stress, the frustration with um, the log jams that we're seeing across our country and in all industries. Um, and we know from um, Medicaid experiments, the Oregon experiments, um, that when people gain insurance or gain better insurance, their mental health is the first thing to improve. Right? And so we we understand that when people lose insurance or they they drop down to a different metal level or different thing, even small increases in out of pocket expenses, they start to they forego a fifteen dollar increase in the cost of a medicine. They stop taking the medicine, and so. I have this this worry of a cycle where there are increased out of pocket expenses, um, people not uh, taking care of themselves as well, and then ending up with unplanned and and less reimbursed um, inpatient stays and ED visits, and then the response the way that we've built our systems to date from an administra hospital administration standpoint is seeing those losses then the response is to increase prices. And, and that, that cycle is at the heart of the sustainability process that we're, that we're in. And, and so I don't have a solution for that this morning. Um, I hear your commitment to uh, your community. I wanted to share those worries um, that you know, the, the the equity diversity part, the families that are likely to feel some of this the most are working class families who are just making enough to not be on Medicaid right? and to have employer subsidized insurance, but the, the subsidies are lessening. Those families are often single parent families, so women are more affected, oftentimes uh, members of historically economically disadvantaged communities. So there's an equity question there too with our, our rising prices. Um, and I also think there's a connection to the violence that we're seeing. People are already so frustrated with their lives and mental health is such a struggle already adding more expenses or not being able to, to um, get healthcare because you can't afford it just adds to that. So. I, I just I see your commitment. I wanted to share some of the other things that that I and I know the other board members are trying to keep in mind as we um, try to work through such a difficult time. And uh, so thank you again for everything that you're doing. Um, it's noted. It's appreciated. As a new board member, hearing your history uh, um, in the past of returning funds to uh, rate payers. Um, that's an appropriate place to also say unprecedented. So so thank you for all that you're doing. And, and with that, I'll pass it back uh, to Chair Holmes. Great, thank you, Tom. Can, can, I, can I just add, add one piece to Member Walsh's um, sure. concerns? It, one of the things that we, I don't think we presented in the budget and the data that we've sent is when you look at Rutland Regional's charge master or charges and where we're at the market or where we're below the market, one of the areas we have tried to keep below the market has been in lab costs. Um, with Judy, uh, part of the problem is rate increases are decreasingly effective. And Judy has often said, um, where do you apply rate increases? Because there's not much room on some things and so forth. But one of the areas we've tried to hold the line on has been on lab charges. 
And it's because of exactly what you said, Member Walsh, the health equity and also the, the population health type of a thing. So that we might not be able to be the low cost emergency medicine provider when you have that critical, you know, isolated thing. But we are trying to hold the line on lab tests uh, that you need to preserve your health. And oftentimes we hear, uh, especially in the clinics, the docs telling us every day they have patients who say, Doc, I, I, I know I need to get this blood test. I just can't afford it. We've tried to be below the market in those areas that are kind of the bread and butter things that improve people's, that, that maintain people's health and prevent them from coming to see um, Dr. Davis and Nurse Collins in the emergency department and having it exacerbate to a full medical crisis. So we are trying to do um, some work in that area, even with these price increases. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I like hearing the thoughtfulness that you're applying even within the charge master. And I agree with you um, that the looking at the rates and like, where do we apply them? How much impact does it have? Um, we need a different discussion in, in, the, in the future to really try to get a handle on the sustainability part because the, the charges and the rates aren't the, are probably not the best means to achieving the goals that we're after. So thank you for just um, sharing that. It's another example of your commitment to really dive into the details and, and look at things. So I appreciate that, Claudia. Great. Um, so I guess I'm up last. Um, and not surprisingly, Judy, you anticipated many of my questions. So I appreciated that very much. Clearly you've been doing your homework and, and listening in on uh, other hearings. Um, in particular, I wanna thank you for your estimates of what the effective commercial rate is. Um, I think it's really helpful for us to understand that relationship between the change in charge and what in effect commercial rate payers will feel in their pocketbooks. So that was a really helpful number to have. Um, and you know, I anticipate ask like if we can ask for that in advance in the hospital budget hearings, you know, and submissions next year, I think it'll help and save everybody a lot of time on the fly trying to figure it out now. Um, I also wanted to thank you, Judy. I know you put some numbers around that annual cost of the borders that are awaiting placement in psych or in you know uh, post-acute settings, and it sounds like your estimate around two and a half to three million dollars a year. That's a pretty significant cost, and since I know you've been listening, um, I'm trying to, you know, and, and Voss and Mike Del Treco has agreed that, that this is a this is a number. If we can quantify across the state, it would be really helpful. So you, you know, you, your quantification of that number is really helpful in that endeavor. If we can start to see what this impact is in terms of costs, we might be able to start making inroads into alleviating these bottlenecks if we understand how large a problem it is. Am I right then that for you know for Rutland's annual boarding costs that that might contribute as much as two to two and a half percentage points in cost uh, in your rate ask? Is yes, that you are. Is that right? Yes, and, and and I would argue not only is it expensive, it's the wrong way to care for these patients. Absolutely, they're not in the right setting. Yeah, but yes, no, you are correct. Right. Inappropriate care settings, you know, impact the quality of care delivery, and they impose a cost on the system. So it's uh, it's a problem for access, quality, and and cost, without a doubt. Um, so thank you for that. That's really helpful. My my next question really is about you know with this possible and maybe optimistic end to the public health emergency in 23. Have you given thought or are there any assumptions in your budget if there are Medicaid redeterminations about what happens to those folks who are on Medicaid, then no longer are eligible after the public health emergency expires? What proportion do you think will switch to private? What proportion to become uninsured? How have you all thought about that? So we have not um, postured and, and had a position in that. Um, that's something, again, another risk in the budget, an unknown. Um, it, it's likely that some of those patients would become uninsured um, and we would have to pick those patients up in our financial assistance program. Uh, we do have a fairly generous program. We provide full free care up to 300%. 
uh, and partial free care up to 500% of the federal poverty level. We have increased free care slightly, um, but not enough to, uh, to take care of a significant transition of a patient population from an insured Medicaid status to an uninsured. Yeah, and there's some opportunity for some of those to switch to the QHP with the subsidies. So they, you know, it's, I think it's anybody's crystal ball to figure out what is that, you know, who, yeah. who moves where. So I, I will say this is one service we're really proud of at the hospital. We have a financial counseling office uh, that we have three certified um, advisors who can work with patients who do work with patients to enroll them in the exchange. We're very active. Um, we were uh, somewhat inhibited and, and limited during COVID to, to have uh, these conversations with the patients, but certainly poised and positioned to re-engage in, in all of those conversations. And I think of um, our role there as really advocating for the patient, and it is a service that I think um, Rutland is proud to offer. Yeah, that's fantastic, especially with the extension of the subsidies. So hopefully there are many folks who, you know, were eligible for those subsidies but didn't purchase on the on the exchange and so lost out on that. So hopefully that information can can be transmitted um, and people people can take every advantage of those subsidies in the upcoming year. Um, you're one of the few hospitals actually to highlight many of the important efforts you've been making to improve productivity, um, particularly as a strategy to navigate the workforce crisis. So I really appreciate and want to acknowledge that important work. And I just wanted to hear a little bit about your views on the pros and cons of using, and I think this is the measure that you're using to assess productivity, but the FTE per adjusted occupied bed, whether, you know, what are the pros and cons of using that as a as a proxy or a measure of productivity? Are there other ones that you also considered and saw uh, improvements in? Well, it's one of the ones that uh, is a standard out there that you can look at some benchmark information. Mm -hmm. Judy, you want to talk about some of the challenges and other things? Yeah, so, so it's a proxy. Uh, trying to look at inpatient volume and adjust that uh, for outpatient activity. It's price sensitive, right? Um, and so that is a challenge. But I will tell you, we have measures at the department level here um, that are based on individual utilization for whatever that service lab test, imaging test, uh, the visit. And, and we look at productivity at that level um, that's an enormous amount of information. Uh, and so we roll that up, the result of that in this um, industry standard. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. Um, my last you know, question is actually a little bit around the wait times and I wanted to thank you for the data um, and on the information on how you're seeking to address some of the access issues, it's really helpful. And I'm wondering on that slide 27, I think it was, are there specialty areas that are your highest priority to address, um, given the look that you have there for the cl clinic visit lag? Is there are there areas that you're really focusing those efforts on, in particular, in terms of recruitment, in terms of scheduling changes, any of the things that you might uh, be doing to address that? Yeah, I, I, a couple of areas. One of the biggest challenges we have right now is otolaryngology. Um, our uh, senior ENT surgeon is um, retiring uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, in the four and a half years I've been here at Rutland, we have put a full court press on trying to find a replacement for him. Um, we'll be down to one uh, ear, nose, and throat physician and surgeon in that practice. We're trying to, uh, that's one of the areas that we're working at trying to do some innovative things to augment and support that service with um, advanced practice providers. Um, but there's limitations to that. So that is one, uh, one challenge that we are focusing on. I think um, some of those specialty areas, member homes that provide um, kind of the mix between advanced care and um, primary care are really important and that's where we're trying to work with our primary care partners and others in the clinically integrated network 
because uh, we have a limited resource in board certified cardiologists or um, endocrinologists, right? And they, you know, as the stresses and pressures on the primary care system also increase significantly, you know, really where the frontline diabetes and the, and the primary hypertension need to be managed is in the primary care setting. You don't need a board certified cardiologist to do that work. And as a matter of fact, when you've got limited resources, it could crowd out some of the more important work. So how do we work better together to try to do that? And ultimately, the holy grail in this is to prevent the pre-diet, to identify the patients at risk of pre-diabetes, um, like stressed out, overweight hospital CEOs who don't really exercise as well and maybe don't eat as well as they should <laughs> before they end up with a major event and uh, end up um, in the care of these people because we're probably not the best patients. That's where the holy grail of this is, right? If we can do that and we can work together to prevent that, there's a whole, there's, there's a whole stream of costs downstream that we can interrupt, hopefully. Hard work, um, uncharted work in a lot of ways. But that's where we're trying to manage that when we're managing access to specialty care. And we're also at like, hey, um, we're also working with the clinics to make them as productive and efficient as possible so we can see as many patients as possible with those resources. Because the reality is in a rural area, um, these folks can't do it on their own without the resources of a either a larger group, which you don't have enough economies of scale in Vermont to do, or the only other alternative is to be hospital employed. No, I appreciate that answer and I appreciate your passion. Um, this was, you know, this was our first year of trying to collect this kind of referral lag and visit lag data. Um, and I think, you know, to varying degrees, hospitals were able to I would say doing the, the visit lag data seemed to be easier than the referral lag, right? Because collecting that information on the data referral is made seems like that was, you know, available for some hospitals and not available for others. Um, and I'm wondering if it's possible, you know, to going forward, collect that referral date data so that referral lags are something that you collect as you probably know, um, you know, referral lags in some parts of the state are real sources of frustration for primary um, care providers and patients. And so to the degree, again, if, if we can't measure it, we can't fix it because we don't know it's a problem. So I would just ask if that's a if that's a possibility to consider in your EMR system and, and collecting that data. I do want to give you a shout out, though, because I am one of those patients who came from out of the area into the Rutland system. Um, you know, moving over, I had been waiting for over a month for an MRI to be scheduled. Literally, the referral lag was more than four weeks. And super frustrated, I gave up. I called Rutland. Your team set my appointment that afternoon, and I was seen within a week. So to, to the extent that your teams are doing a great job, kudos for making that happen. Um, but I do think it'd be helpful for us to really understand what that, where those referral lags are. Um, if but Mr. Holmes, is, isn't that a great indication of the incredible stress that our system is under? <laughs> MRIs are one of those few things that Judy's happy about the increased volume because we make money on those. The one of those small group, smaller and smaller group of things that subsidize the myriad of stuff that we don't. And so when you can't get in to get an MRI, it's certainly not by uh, hospital administrators, and it's it's because the system is tenuous and breaking down that we can't even get the lucrative, economically lucrative stuff done. So which is, that's where the incentive is today, right, in the fee-for-service world. And so that's part of, you know, I think that's a great illustration of the challenges that we have ahead of us as we try to recover from, from the pandemic. Yeah, and just, just a word uh, that day. <laughs> your challenge to us, um, 
if it was solely up to the hospital, we, we might have half a chance to get your referral leg, but it's really based on physicians and their adoption of electronic medical records. One of our busiest physician practices here in town is, in, is on paper. Um, and so paper processes do not lend themselves for this type of reporting. Um, this is where, you know, disparate EMRs trying to come together, um, it's a challenge. So we'll continue the work, um, but uh, we don't necessarily control the inputs. Um, and that is, that will forever be a challenge here. I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Um, my last question is just a standard question I've been asking everybody, but obviously I'm asking if you would share any known or likely changes to federal or state payments, um, relief funds, any unexpected increases in Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates. You've already done that. I recognize the 600K from the Medicare bump up. Um, just, you know, since your budget submission or anything that happens in the next few weeks, it'd be helpful if you could send a, an email to Sarah Lindbergh if there's anything unexpected in terms of changes in those uh, payments or opportunities. Um, with that, I'm actually going to just turn it over to our hospital finance team to see if they have any questions. Hi, thanks, uh, Chair Holmes. Uh, it's Russ McCracken. I'm going to stand in for Sarah Lindbergh today to realize. Um, I think just one staff question uh, or perhaps request. So we're looking at um, the slides in the presentation on slide 13. It shows a uh, net rate increase impact for Medicare of about 1.6 million. I recognize some of that is um, newer from the, the um, Medicare inpatient rule. Um, looking at the budget submission and the appendices in uh, slide one, which is a reconciliation appendix, um, it, it doesn't carry forward any rate effect for uh, Medicare. And so we were wondering if you could provide an updated uh, appendix one yeah, so, so all of this information uh, is consolidated in the rates and uh, utilization uh, pair mix line, I believe is the name of it, but we can certainly provide that information to you. Oh, I see. So it, it's for Medicare, it's not broken out as a rate effect. It's factored into the reimbursement and payer mix line. Correct. Yes, it is included. Okay. There. Uh, I think that addresses our question, but if if there's more, Sarah and team will follow up with you directly. So, Thank you, Russ. Appreciate much. it. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I would like to open it up to the HCA for questions. Sam, is that you? That's me. Thanks so much, Chair Holmes. I'll kick things off and then I'll pass it to Mike Fisher. Uh, Sam Peich, Health Policy Analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Good morning, everyone. I think it's still morning, yep. Uh, just wanted to start off by commending uh, Rutland Regional on a couple of elements that you spoke to today and also really shown through in your narrative, particularly the DEI strategic plan. I think it's notable that you have attached clear metrics for evaluating your progress towards this and as well as a timeline to hold yourself accountable. And also want to recognize, I mean, this is a small point, but I think it's important recognize the importance of reevaluating your registration process to ensure appropriate language and tools to capture racial and gender identity. So I really want to commend you for that. Um, I think a part of these efforts really led into the Loan Institute ranking you the most socially responsible hospital in the state in 22. Um, and I think it's notable that you didn't mention that, so that demonstrates some clear humility. Um, and also want to highlight the work you've done updating your patient financial assistance policies to come into compliance a little bit early, um, making some progress towards Act 119. Um, so the first question that I have follows up a little bit on the area of health equity. It came through pretty clearly the impacts on your community that you estimate or project if your charge requests aren't approved as requested. But I was wondering if you still plan to follow through on your race equity and DEI focused efforts, regardless of what the decision is made by the board. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I think we've seen uh, 
the national reckoning in the summer of 2020 and and uh, and the challenges we have uh, every organization has in, in dealing with this and um, we are absolutely I think our board that's why they created intentionally and and redid our whole values as an organiz organization to create diversity equity and inclusion as one of four core core values I don't see that changing regardless of the economics of challenges that we have uh, so forth. It's, it's, those are things that we're dealing with as an organization and they're seeing in the emergency department, my colleagues here every day, the impact of, of those challenges on our community. Thank you, I appreciate it. That's great to hear. Um, this was talked about a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the ramifications if you were to violate your debt covenant and if there are any efforts underway independent of the charge request to resolve the issue. Yeah, so uh, we have been very proactive in working uh, with both TD Bank and the USDA. We are deliberating a forbearance agreement. Um, that forbearance agreement has not been um, you know, articulated and agreed upon yet, but certainly we've been engaged in conversations uh, with them for the last two months. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, last question for me before I turn it to Mike. Um, at the UVM Health Network hearing, we heard a little bit about their decision to invest $3 million to create a population health services organization, which would incorporate One Care Vermont. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the obstacles and opportunities that this change potentially presents for your involvement uh, with that organization. You know, we um, were active partners uh, in, in One Care, sitting on uh, any available board or committee that we can. Uh, we would certainly partner uh, going forward uh, with, with UVM. Um, can't say we can comment on what that looks like, but um, we do believe in population health um, and are very committed to that. Yeah, yeah. I think w without knowing how that really looks, uh, Stan, it's, it's hard to fully comment. Other than I got to tell you, we wouldn't be where we are right now if it wasn't for UVM stepping up and, and, and creating One Care Vermont. No one else had the resources to do that. We certainly didn't as the second largest hospital, UVM and Dartmouth, when they came and founded that. It certainly isn't perfect, and there's certainly a lot of work and challenges, but I'll tell you, um, They've invited us to the table, anyone who wants to participate. It could look very different, and it does look very different in other parts of the country, right? Where the ACO uh, are just four system members. This is a very different model. It's not perfect. We acknowledge it. Uh, Judy's on the finance committee. I, I'm on the board. Um, they've invited us to be part of the governance of it. It's not perfect, but I think, um, I think in Vermont, we recognize the academic medical centers uh, and even our partners across the river in, in New Hampshire realize with this population and the cult medical culture here and the challenges we have, it's a different type of environment that we work as hospitals together, large or small. So um, I, I don't see any big threats that this will create. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, thank you, Roland. Good to be here. Um, uh, for over the years, over the last couple of years, we've been very articulate about our appreciation of Rutland's uh, free care and bad debt numbers. Um, your, your, your 21 actual numbers are indeed the best in the state. And, well, and, and we arrived at that uh, uh, that appreciation, not only because of the numbers, but after having visited with your financial advisors and getting a firsthand view of how they approach their work. Um, so in that context, I just wanted to ask you to, as I look at your, uh, your 22 projected numbers and your 23 budgeted numbers with regard to free care and bad debt, uh, they get progressively worse from our perspective. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about why you think that might be happening or if that's a concern to you. 
Sure. Um, so our projected numbers, our budgeted numbers for 23 are, are based on actual utilization. Any dollar that we can transfer from bad debt to free care, uh, we will work very hard to do that. Um, we are seeing a, a, a difficulty in having patients engage in the application process and submit data. Happy to share uh, what those uh, statistics look like. But suffice it to say, it, it is extremely difficult. Uh, COVID didn't help when we shut down access face-to-face uh, -face with our financial counselors. We are at the point where we're re-engaging, inviting them back into our facility. Um, so I'm hoping that we bend that curve and we see uh, more utilization in our free care program than our bad debt. We also um, have looked at the new regulation we've adopted um, the household income uh, modification early, uh, hoping that that would also help us in uh, transitioning some of that bad debt. Yeah, yes, thanks. We, Sam recognized that a few minutes ago. We appreciate, very much appreciate Rutland. Before having an opportunity to ask you the question when you would be moving towards adopting, um, you, you went ahead and do it, did it, and we appreciate that. Um, Okay, I, I, maybe maybe on that same line, I, I think um, I'm looking forward to continuing to hear from you about um, um, about just what it's like to to um, make sure that the people who are getting bills who can't pay them are uh, given the level of support, and I and that makes sense to me that there was a COVID dynamic there. I'm I'll be interested to see how that plays out over the next year. Um, one more question. Um, uh, honestly, I went back and forth, have gone back and forth uh, uh, today about whether to ask you this question. We made a decision very consciously to ask, uh, I don't know if you heard our question to UVM Health Network about race corrections, about, about clinical health equity dynamics. Um, we made a very conscious decision to not ask smaller hospitals that question, to save it for UVM Health Network, given that they're a teaching hospital and their their scale. Um, yet, as I sit here with you and and look at your um, your leadership, frankly, on health equity, uh, I I wanted to raise the issue sort of as a concept. I, I I fully recognize that we we don't generally ask a hospital like Rutland to question clinical standards. Um, yet, when we see something like a, a race correction for a, sp a spirometer uh, measurement um, that according to the Lancet has, um, there's no genetic locus that varies by race. And you know any, any presumption that um, African-Americans have um, smaller lung capacity than their white counterparts is um, based on, based on uh, uh, racist presumptions, I think, or racist history. Um, so, I, and I really just bring that up as an example. Um, I don't know whether that's happening at Rutland or at all Vermont hospitals, but my question is, how do we ask hospitals like, like Rutland to challenge themselves on this kind of a level around clinical practice? I don't think I So there are, there are like, so for example, pulse oximeters don't have the same readings for folks with darker color skin right. and lighter color skin. Some of those type, what are we doing to identify some of those? I will tell you one of the, and, and none of these things are easy. Yeah. One, one of the things we've done over the past year is reprogram our EMR to put, put in place a field for your, um, for your birth gender and your how you identify and, and there's a whole process that goes along with the technical piece of that to make sure that we um, capture people's gender appropriately in the ED and it, it impacts how they're cared for. So we're doing some of that work. I will tell you, not that I'm a UVM apologist, but this is where we need an academic medical center in the state of Vermont. No one else has those resources. No one else has the research capability and the and the folks to do this. And some of that, they're going to set the standard, and we're going to we're going to work with them and take their lead. I think. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that from our clinical. Um, 
I would just say, I think that that kind of education is happening, um, sort of in section meetings, in nursing training days, um, and we have been seeing payoffs. It's, there's a difference, certainly as far as transgender care, both in terms of the way that the EMR um, tries to um, give the providers an accurate um, accurate information about a patient's um, a patient's gender and and chosen name. I mean, even the name that they used that was something that was really hard to be able to see on the screen and. Um, there's been a lot of work in terms of making those modifications, um, and that has paid off. Um, we had a patient not that long ago who posted um, to our Facebook about how from the moment uh, the patient entered the department, um, the right pronouns were used. Every single person who interacted with that patient used the patient's chosen pronouns, and they gave a shout out, and it made us feel really good about the work that we've done, um, the respect that we're showing our patients, and that it, we're a safe place for people to, to choose to receive their care. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Holmes. That's all our questions for today. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Important questions. Uh, at this point, I would like to open it up to public comment. Uh, if anybody would like to comment on the presentation today or the budget submitted by Rutland Regional, please use the raise your hand function and I will acknowledge you. And if you are calling on the phone and would like to just speak up, that is okay too. Okay, I'm seeing no hands raised and hearing nobody. So it doesn't sound like we have much public comment. Um, thank you to the Rutland team for your time today, the clarity of your presentation, and most importantly, for the work that you do for your community. You've given us a lot to process as we approach deliberations over the next couple of weeks, but thank you for your time. And with that, we're going to take a recess for lunch, and we, I'm going to stay on the schedule. Uh, we'll return at 1.30 to hear from Mount Escutney. Thank you all. Appreciate yeah. seeing you all this morning. Thank you very, very much.